Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here today for Quick Tip Thursday. Today's topic, we have Greg Ristami online with us to talk about how he created this Staples Center miniature. He used a few different Topaz programs, so I'm excited to see his workflow for this. Greg is our featured trade show rep and he is kind of a Topaz expert. So with that, I will hand it over to Greg. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that great introduction. Let me go ahead and uh, <clears throat> show my screen here to everybody. Can everybody see the screen okay? Uh, Nicole, can you see the screen okay? Uh, yes, I can. It looks good. You can? Okay, that's wonderful. All righty. So uh, as Nicole just uh, stated, yeah, so this is going to be the explanation of how I put together the Staples Center image. Um, now, first, what I want to show everybody actually is what the a final image look like, and then this is the image that uh, you see that's the final results that we're trying to get to. In fact, I will uh, just kind of maximize that on the screen right now so that uh, everybody can get an idea of what that looks like. And uh, I'll even zoom into it just slightly just so that you can see some of the details that are going on over here. Um, and then we're going to take this image um, and we will break it down into all of its components and the workflow that I went through. So now uh, I'm going to get rid of all of the different layers that I have here in Photoshop and start just from the original photo. So this is the photo that started it all. Um, I'm a big Lakers fan, so I found a, one of my pictures. In this case, actually, this was not a Lakers game. This was a Clippers game that I had the photo from. Now I'm going to zoom into it just a little bit just to show you a little bit of what happens in a regular photo of a stadium. Uh, first of all, um, when you're photographing things from very far away, everything is in focus. The things that are closest to the camera, which in this case is the bleachers and the details there, are in perfectly in focus, as well as if we were to go to the furthest point here in the photograph, which is uh, all the way in the back, all of those things are in focus as well. So uh, you essentially, if you're photographing a miniature and we're trying to create this effect of a full miniature, uh, things are not always going to be in focus. You're going to have both the foreground and the background be out of focus. Another thing that's typical about miniatures is that as I zoom in, you're going to see that reality has a lot of details. For example, on the floor of the Staples Center, the wood has details. In fact, as we look here along the right-hand side, you'll see that there's these little rivets and details that are just about everywhere. So the first thing that I did was I put the image through Topaz Clean. Uh, now, this is going to be very subtle. I'm going to kind of go back and forth between just so you can see what's going on. This is the way that the image started. So you can see how we've got all these little details there of the patterns that are on the floor, as well as the patterns that you'll see here, for example, on this um, red Bank of America advertisement. Whereas now when we look at the after, because of Topaz Clean, it's really simplified everything out. So that's usually the first step that I take when I'm trying to um, do any of these you know, uh, false miniature images because a miniature wouldn't have as many small subtle details as reality would. So once I did that, the next step was I created this depth map. Now um, from within um, Topaz Lens Effects, you can actually create beautiful depth maps. Uh, but in this case, what I wanted was just a really convenient uh, gradient and you also notice something else that I added into that depth map, which is if I go forward here, um, where the big central jumbotron is, right in the middle of the Staples Center, I actually painted a depth map with a value of gray. And the reason why I chose a gray was because um, as I looked at the floor of the Staples Center, I imagined where that would be floating above the floor. And so I kind of said to myself, well, approximately how far uh, away from the front do I think that is. So I estimated it that it might be somewhere around where the C is there, the word clippers. Hence, I basically sampled the color, of the gradient that I had drawn here in Photoshop. And that color of gray ended up being what I did the fill for this outline. And that outline, actually, I created using uh, Topaz's Remask, which um, you've seen some of my other webinars where we explain how uh, amazing Remask is. So at this point, once that depth map was created, then this is actually the depth map that I used in um, Topaz Lens Effects to create this effect. Now I'm actually going to um, show you that workflow right now. So let's go ahead and take um, this uh, cleaned version of the image, and under Filter, 
we'll pull down the Topaz Labs, Topaz Lens Effects. Okay, there we are. So by default, Lens Effects is going to apply one of the presets here to it. And over here, I'm going to select the Bouquet Selective, which is um, one of our effects presets that's going to allow us to apply a depth map. Next, I will load that depth map that I had created from before. Now, these depth maps have to be a TIFF file so that if you ever think about doing the same thing that I've done, just make sure you create um, a TIFF formatted image. And let me go ahead and find it here for you. Uh, I put it under my remask images folder. Okay, let's take a look. It should be right there. There we go. Staples depth map. Tip. Okay, now once that loads up, um, let me actually show you what that looks like. I'm going to collapse the left-hand side of the screen just so we get a little bit more real estate. And when you click on the Edit Depth Map button, you'll be able to see exactly the depth map that you have created, and it's just going to show it right here inside of the Lens Effects interface. Now that we've done that, um, you can see that by default, um, Lens Effects it doesn't really know where to focus along in that depth map. So immediately afterwards, I selected the focal plane adjustment. And here, where it says Select Focal Plane, you want to click on that and just click somewhere right in the center of where the, you know, um, the actual main basketball court is going to be. So now you notice that the background now does go out of focus. So I want the foreground to go out of focus as well. So I'm going to bring up the, a little bit of the foreground blur right here. And uh, as I look, now you can see that the foreground went out of focus as well. And this is actually where things get really fun because um, because now you have both the foreground and the background out of focus, you can now actually experiment with clicking in different places. So let's say, for example, if you wanted to focus on the things that are all the way in the background, you can actually click on that part of the image, and you'll notice that the things that are in the foreground go out of focus while the things that are in the background are in focus. But uh, let's just go back to what we wanted to do and just click right here in the center of the, the basketball court. Okay, so now that we've got um, the things blurred, both in the foreground and the background. Uh, the next thing that I do is that I always um, make sure that I don't over blur things. Uh, people usually kind of overestimate or they want to exaggerate this uh, depth of field effect. So uh, apply it sparingly, and that's the way you're going to get the most you know, realistic results. Another one of the things that I like to do is at this point, usually I'll zoom in just to see if some of the things that I want to make sure stay in focus actually are in focus. Like in this case, I wanted to make sure that the players actually are in focus, and they are. And also this little stand over here, which later on I'm going to use for when my fingers come in to actually hold it, I wanted to make sure that was going to be in focus as well. So um, once we got that, now to add realism to that depth of field effect, under the lens characteristics, I used actually a circular blade for my aperture. And again, in the background here, you're immediately going to see that instead of there being a pentagon, the depth of field um, uh, lens characteristic actually is going to be circular, or the aperture, pardon me, is a circular shape. The highlight boost is very, very important. When you bring up the highlight boost, look what's going to happen. It's going to take the lights that are here that surround the staple center, and it's going to blow them out. And this is normally what would happen with real depth of field, is that things that are really bright, like lights, would um, actually get quite a bit you know, brighter, whereas things that are normal, that don't have any lights on it, are not going to get this blown out kind of an effect. Uh, as a matter of, fact, matter of fact, I'm going to zoom in on it here for you just to show you how beautiful this effect looks. So um, let's go here to the upper left-hand corner of the screen, and I'll wait for it to recalculate. And so there you have it. You got to keep in mind that this is what the image looks like normally, and again, where all these little lights are in the background, just because of that highlight boost, we've been able to just blow out those lights, and it looks really beautiful. So uh, the last thing that I usually do when it comes to applying topaz lens effects is where it says focal blur area adjustment. Now you have to cons you have to constantly keep in mind that you're trying to mimic what a miniature would look like, and a miniature is not going to have this level of contrast. So the areas that are blurry, the first thing that I do is I make it quite a bit brighter. Now watch what's going to happen. You're going to see that all, only the areas that are blurry now became brighter because we want to make it seem as if there is more light uh, being cast into this miniature than what normally would happen. Also, miniatures oftentimes have more saturation. So now you notice that I'm going to crank up the saturation just again, for the areas that are blurry 
And so now we have a little bit more color in there. But that might be a little too much. Let me ease off on that a bit. Okay. So that's essentially the steps that I went through to actually create the um, the depth map, or I should say the, the depth of field effect version of the Staples Center. And so that is uh, what looks like this image right here. Okay. Now you can see that in this one, I actually didn't do it as extreme as I had done previously, which is exactly what we were talking about. And finally, um, one of the problems that I noticed was that because in my depth map, I had not put in the cables that hold up the little jumbotron, um, I actually kind of cheated and I just went in there and I drew a few lines. And I don't know if you can see that or not. I'm going to zoom in on it so you can see it better. Okay. Um, in the original version, there were no cables <laughs> that were holding up that jumbotron. And so I just kind of like referenced the original image and I also referenced these lines that were there and I just drew in some lines going up and down. Uh, and I added a little bit of noise into it just to make it seem a little bit more realistic. Um, but that's uh, a little subtlety that I added in just to make that seem more believable, you know, as if the cables actually are in focus there. Now comes the part where we're going to do the hand. Okay, so let me actually turn on the hand layer and show you what happens if the hand doesn't have any shadows or any of the other effects applied to it. So um, I used Topaz's remask actually to cut the hand out of the background. And if you're wondering what that looks like, let me show you what my hand looks like right here. Okay, so that is the original photo for the hand. Um, I just set up my camera on a tripod and I just kind of posed in my office and took that picture and <laughs> that's what I got. Uh, and the flash in this case was you know, bouncing off the back wall. So uh, I got a nice evenly lit version of my hand pinching with my fingers. Um, here's a quick note about using cutouts as elements like this uh, in your compositions. Here is what the hand looks like after it's gone through Topaz Lens Effect. And uh, just for the purposes of demonstration, I want to show you what would happen if you take a traditional cutout that's got a mass channel attached to it, and if you were to blur it. Okay, take a look at what's going to happen. Let's choose a little Gaussian blur. And again, for the purposes of demonstration, I'm going to really exaggerate this. Okay? And the reason why I'm exaggerating is because I want you to notice how along the perimeter of my hand, I see this white glow. And you might be wondering, where's that white glow coming from? Well, that white glow is coming from, you've got to keep in mind that the original hand was photographed against a very whitish kind of a background. So when I apl apply my blur, it's going to give me that white glow, which in a final composite is going to be actually not very nice. You're going to get that glow always. So here's what I recommend for you to do. Um, when you do your cutouts in Topaz's remask, just right click on your uh, quick mask and simply say apply layer mask. Okay? Now you'll notice that it's no longer its own mask channel and that mask actually has been applied to the image. Now I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. I will go back up to filter and choose the same Gaussian blur and now look what kind of a difference that made. Okay? So let's give you a little before and after. You got to keep in mind originally this is what we were getting before where we had that white glow around it. Whereas now, because we applied our mask, we no longer have any of that. Well, actually, there's, there we go. This is a better version right there. There we go. We no longer have that white border around it. Let me give you that before and after again. So this is what it used to look like, where we had that white border around it. And here's what it looks like now. Now, the reason why this blurring is very important is um, even though it seems like my hand here in the shot is um, actually in focus, it is actually slightly blurry because when I put it in there, I wanted to match the blur that was already there as a part of the background. And that's when I noticed this and that's why I'm adding it in. So uh, in this case, it was nothing more than just scaling it and making sure that my fingers lined up over here. And uh, the other thing that I did is I just made sure that I went in there and erased just that little tip right here. So it would make it seem as if I am actually holding on to uh, the, the back of that basketball stand. Um, and then finally, if I zoom in, you will notice that my fingers here in the background are actually blurry. And that's in contrast to the tip of my knuckle here on my index finger. Now the way that I did that was, as I was thinking about the composite, uh, I know that this, the depth of field effect has to be everywhere. So I just selected the uh, Photoshop's blur tool and with a brush, I just lightly brushed over the back fingers where my pinky and my third 
uh, ring finger is, and that just I added in an, uh, an extra layer of blur for those fingers. Uh, also, because I knew that my hand is going to be kind of coming into a shot, I used uh, just traditional you know, burning tools to darken my wrists so it would seem more realistic as if there was a light that was shining onto the center of the miniature so that my wrists would uh, kind of blend for, further into the sides of the image. And finally, uh, some of the most important parts of compositing are the shadows. So let me just for a moment turn on that shadow element without my hand. And I'm also going to really crank up the intensity of the shadow. Uh, it's nothing more than a very rough black outline <laughs> that I drew. Uh, there is really no logic behind this. It's just kind of like what I imagined what the shadow of my hand would look like on a miniature. And right after I drew that, as you can see, I blurred it quite a bit. Uh, and now it was nothing more than just bringing down the intensity of it until it matched, you know, aesthetically what I would think a uh, shadow underneath my hand would look like. Uh, just to give you a little before and after, here is what my hand looks like without the shadow. And here is what it looks like with that shadow introduced. And then another thing that happens all the time is when, you, uh, when your hand gets close to a miniature, right underneath my fingers, there should be a little bit of darkness. Okay, again, I'm going to turn that on here for you just so you can see what that looks like. Okay, first let me show you what it, did, what it looked like without that little darkness. So that's where it is just very, very bright. And here's what it looks like with that uh, little darkness applied. So because my fingers are so close, whatever it was underneath it should get quite a bit dark. And that, again, is nothing more than just me uh, kind of drawing in a little bit of black over there on its own layer. In fact, I call that layer shadow under fingers. So that, again, added to the realism of that, uh, of my hand actually being a part of that set. Now, finally, uh, this is one of my favorite tricks here, is I added in glow. Okay, and I just turned that on here right now. Let me zoom in just so you can see what the glow effect is doing. Here is the composite without the glow element added in, and here is the composite with the glow element introduced into it. Um, the glow element is nothing more than just the background that's been blurred a lot, <laughs> and it's been it's being applied as you can see here using the screen technique um, onto the original image. Now, when you blur the background and you use screen to add it back on here again, the results that you get is these these little subtle highlights, and you can see it's very very dark right now, but. Um, by taking the mask that I have from my hand and inverting it, I blacked out the rest of the image of the staple center. So uh, essentially all you get is just that glow that bleeds in around the hand. And again, I'll turn everything else on just so you see what that looks like. So there is the element without the glow, and here's the element with the glow. And uh, it was based on just a simple observation that if my fingers were in front of a big jumbotron back there, uh, obviously a jumbotron is bright so that it would have uh, some element of blur or a blowout that happens in the lens. And that's why that adds that final extra touch to it. And of course, I had to finish my masterpiece with my signature. So there you go. Here's my signature that I just put in as a text down in the lower right hand corner. So that's uh, essentially the rundown of every little element that went into creating that composite. Thanks, Greg. That was great. That was a lot of information and definitely saw your workflow. Thank you. You're welcome. We are going to stay online with you for anybody who has any questions. Um, if you want to type in your questions to the questions module on the GoToWebinar panel, and if you have a few extra minutes, Greg and I will be happy to stay online and answer those. All right, we have quite a few people asking about the glow. If you could go over that workflow of how to create that, that layer. Okay, so uh, essentially what I start out with is just the image that has already come out of um, lens effects. And uh, first I make a copy of it. Okay, so I'm going to Command J, so we make a copy of that. Um, the next thing I want to do is to uh, change it into a screen mode. Now you're going to notice it's suddenly going to make everything very, very bright, which is okay. <laughs> you know. Then uh, you want to apply some blur. Now usually what I do at this point is that uh, I'll take that element that I've just created and I'll put it above the element that I'm going to have with a hand. Okay, so this will really show me 
um, what that's going to look like as I start kind of like doing this blur effect to it. And uh, here I'm going to, I'll even drop out the, the background that's there and just apply a, a Gaussian blur to that uh, layer. Okay, so, so here as I apply the Gaussian blur, I notice that this is a little too much. Um, essentially what I want to do is look for these areas that are right around my fingers. I'm going to zoom in on here just so I can see what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the areas that are um, surrounding the bright parts of the image. Okay, and I want to see if these highlights, how they bloom or how they glow or expand around my fingers. And when I get like some level of blur that I like, I hit OK on that. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing that I want to do here is I will actually take my uh, layer mask that's there and actually I'm going to apply the layer mask. You'll see that it will become a part of my hand. And I'm going to command click on it and this way it's going to select just the mask for my hand. You want to invert your selection. Okay. Now going back to the layer that you have for the glow, which is the one that we just blurred, um, just fill that in with black. So under the edit, choose fill, and black is perfectly fine, and you get okay on that. Okay. So now you notice that what just happened is that we took everything that was um, around the perimeter with, of that image and we just basically cut it out. So we don't because we don't really need it anymore, you know. Um, the other thing that I like to do here is that I take the I take the selection, and I'm going to actually contract it quite a bit. Well, in this case, actually, I need to expand it because I got to keep in mind that this is actually for the outside, right? So let me first invert it so it will be now considering once again the hand, and then I want to um, uh, contract that. I'm going to contract it actually quite a bit here. Let's contract it by maybe about. Um, I don't know, let's make it about, about 10 pixels. Okay, and uh, that should be pretty good, but let me make it even more than that. Let me undo it and uh, modify, contract. Let's do it maybe somewhere about like 19 or 20. Probably like about yeah, 19 should be good. Let's say it okay. Okay, so now you can see that it's actually eaten in on the mask. And for that, once again, I'm going to fill that in with a black. Living with the black right here. But before you do that, just uh, make sure that you soften that too. So under the selection, let's uh, feather that quite a bit. Let's feather it by a radius of about like you know nine or ten pixels. So nine is okay. There we go. And now fill that in with black too. So uh, image, uh, edit, fill, and black is selected here. We hit okay. Okay. So now here's what just happened. Okay, you notice that uh, this is actually our glow element. Remember that this is the hand. Let me show you what the glow element looks like now all by itself. And let's turn on all of the other layers that were here in the background so that it all starts making some sense. So now you can see that without the glow element, this is what the hand looks like. This is what the uh, hand looks like with the glow element added into it. And now it's just a matter of grabbing your brush and making sure that the color is black. So let me just bring my workspace back. So I can see everything that I'm doing. Brush is black. And as I zoom in, any area that I see that the glow is a little too much, like let's say, for example, that there, I think the glow might be a little too much over there, just uh, black it out. <laughs> okay. So uh, usually I'll choose a, a nice soft brush as I do this. You know, let's make my brush a little bigger. I'll just kind of go around, and any area that logically doesn't make sense, I'll do this. Uh, also, I'll make my brush be not so 100%. I'll do it maybe about... 30% or so, as you can see right up on the top there. And uh, essentially what I'm doing right now is just taking areas where I think that glow was just a little too much and I'm getting rid of it. Okay, like this was a little too much over here, so let's get rid of that. Down at the bottom, I like the red that's coming in in there, but what I don't like is the tip of the fingers, so I just go in here and I black that out. Again, okay, I like a little bit of the glow that's around the edges. So some of this looks pretty good. Let's keep that. This a little too much, so I'm getting I'll get rid of that. So I get I keep a little bit of it. Now this definitely we want to get rid of. So uh, at the bottom there, let's kind of you know do this. And that's pretty much it. Let me uh, just kind of solidify the center of the finger a bit here too, so we get a little better view of it there. And after I've done that, let me show you what that looks like now all by itself. Okay, oops, pardon me. Let me. Uh, bring back my layers so we can actually see just that layer alone against the black background. So that now 
essentially becomes that glow layer. And uh, that's how I created it. <laughs> Very cool. I'm, I'm learning something new, too. I didn't know you could do that. That's great. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, just a couple more questions, and then and we'll let you go. Um, let's see here. Leonard would like you to repeat the elimination of the white glow around the hand. Okay. Um, so let me let me go ahead and toggle that on and off. So it's, this is this is what it looks like when, with the glow element applied to it. I think um, he was talking about the outline of the how you blurred the layer of the hand to eliminate the original oh, glow oh, that oh, came absolutely. in. Oh, yeah, yeah, pardon me. Okay. All right, let me, let me do that here for you. Uh, here's, here's what you're talking about there. Okay. Um, so in, in this case, uh, what happened was like right after I cut out my hand away from the background, uh, this is essentially what I end up with. Okay. Let me zoom away from that just so you can see what it looks like. Um, and what, uh, as you saw, what happened was I, if I blurred that, that would not work and I'll show you how I eliminated it. Under your layers, you want to right click on your layer mask, okay, and choose apply layer mask. And now immediately you'll notice that your layer mask will disappear, but it will apply that layer mask actually to your layer, meaning that the, the background image has now disappeared. Now this is in contrast to when you do use layer masks, let me just show you the difference between them. With the layer mask uh, applied, you can always go back to your Im original image by simply turning off your layer mask, meaning that Photoshop remembers that there are pixels that are outside of that mask area which have color, like in this case it's white, you know, around the outside of it. And, and we don't want that. And by applying the layer mask, you have now forced Photoshop to basically throw out all of the pixels that are surrounding your mask. And therefore, when we blur, you don't blur into that white that was there and then hence you get just a much better results. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you so much, Greg. This was a lot of great information, and, and everybody, I will have this up in the archives soon so you can uh, maybe apply this to your own workflow and check it out and maybe do your own composites. So thanks again, Greg. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, and thanks, everybody, who stuck around, and we will see you at an upcoming webinar. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.